Hey folks, we've got Brian Bunn on, and this I'm looking forward to. Remember, tomorrow is November 4th, and you know what that means, 20 years since Rabine was uh, <laughs> executed, essentially. Um, Brian was the Hebrew University student who organized the lecture. Uh, Brian, why did you believe in me? How did you get involved? Brian? Hello? Um, Nick, maybe you can help me. I see he's on the line, but he's not answering me. Oh, gosh. Boy, do I hate this. All right, folks, I don't know if you can hear me. Um, Nick, tell me if I'm coming through and... I hate when this happens. I truly do. Look, folks, uh, Brian, um, again, I don't know if you can hear me, but I'm going to be talking. I see his picture on the screen, so in theory, uh, he's out there. But, uh, nope, it says, I can hear you, Barry, from Brian, and yet nobody is answering me. Now he's typing. I'm looking. All right. I'm just going to talk if he doesn't want to answer me um, and he just wants to text me. Um, I can hear you. Ba he said he would call on my cell if this happened. No idea what we're talking about. And off you go. Microphone's not working. I guess, see, he can hear me, so my microphone is working. His isn't. All right, folks, I'm going to go backwards. A long time ago, I knew there was something more, uh, something very, very wrong with the Rabin assassination. Mainly, oh, gosh, I hear I'm waiting again. All Hello? right. Can you hear me? I can hear you beautifully now. All right, let's start again then. Uh, All right. At living. Look, you were the Hebrew University student who 17 years ago or so organized the lecture uh, that really changed my life, I got to tell you. Now, how did you get involved? Um, how did you even hear about me? Well, I first heard about you when I was uh, just sitting in uh, winter break and all my friends were playing out in in Greece and Turkey, and I was just kind of sitting around Hebrew University uh, when I was doing some of my Judaic studies uh, work there. Uh, and I was president of the student government at the Rothberg School at the time, and had you know four seats on the on the big you know student government of the whole Hebrew University. And <clears throat> I had seen some uh, some posters around with some what I thought at the time were pretty ludic ludicrous claims uh, about the evidence not fitting and, and you know there you were and now it's this thing at the windmill hotel and in jerusalem and I figured, oh, hey, I, right. I that's aria gallon okay you're you're good um i've forgotten all this all right away we go i'm at the windmill giving the lecture that's root and branch it's coming back <laughs> Yeah, I don't. I don't. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah. I'll. I will suppose it was Arya Gallen. I do remember him. Um, but yeah, so I sat there and ran into one of my favorite professors who taught me how the petrodollar worked, and I'd sit in his office and he'd explain all these very complex things uh, in the world to me. Um, and his wife was there, and we got interviewed, and and I remember sitting there saying to myself, I really don't want to be associated with you know what again, I thought could be kind of craziness coming from you. And so I was, a, you know, an academic and um, had gone through a lot of international leadership training, was involved in APAC. And in fact, before, just before the, your uh, lecture, I went to meet with uh, Lenny Ben David, or at the time Lenny Davis, over there. Right. Uh, to discuss Another name I he, remember, yes. Yeah, so I went to go discuss with him whether he thought there was any merit to what you were presenting, and he was like, "No, there's no merit at all." He said, "It's really simple. The guy was, the guy was caught on videotape. 
he confessed, and he was convicted in the court of law. What else do you want? So I thought, yeah, you know, that makes a lot of sense. I look up to this guy. But you know what? I don't have anything better to do, so I'll go across the, go across the street from the APAC office, and I'll go hear the lecture. And when I sat with that professor and uh, we listened to the lecture, uh, I was quite floored afterwards. And he, it was a really rainy night, and he drove me back to university because I had taken the bus down. And we talked all the way home, and I said, you know, I've got to find a way to, to figure out if this guy's telling the truth or not. I said, you know, that, uh, that evidence is pretty serious. And I figured that the best way to do it would be to have a public forum in front of Israeli academics, um, students and professors, and international students and professors. And I figured, you know, after two, three hours, someone was going to, you know, flinch or be out of bullets and be laying on their backside. And I didn't know which side it was going to be. It was either going to be you or the Israeli government. And I figured one side was going to flinch. And as you <laughs> well know aware, or are well aware that the Israeli government flinched numerous times beforehand. Oh, and, uh, um, they were stuck. At, I'm amazed that finally it's breaking through. Finally, a segment of Israel, religious Zionists, um, have said to hell with this. Um, Chamish was right, and um, our labor government uh, was lying to us. It happened this year. Well, you, you know, it happened. It happened. You know, this was yeah, this was uh, 1997, so it was just over 18 years ago, and it's almost closer to 19 years now because this was literally a, a little more than a year after the assassination. Um, but uh, at the time, I remember there were, you know, two-thirds of the, you know, more the Orthodox, the religious, and the, you know, the more Kippah Huga, the more nationalist society. Two-thirds of them, within the first couple of years after this assassination, did not believe that they were being told the truth. And I think 50% at the time of all of Israelis didn't believe that. But unfortunately, was what happened... Was it really it that 20, high? Um, it was okay. that high from what I heard from what I recall, but here's the problem, right? This is what, this is what, you know, and I call them truth seekers, you know, call them credible academics, whatever, but when you start to publish, you know, things that, you know, don't jive with the social engineering agendas of the state or political engineering agendas, obviously you go up and you go up against the wall. Um, you run right into this wall and that wall is psychic driving. It's social programming. It's propaganda. So unfortunately there's been a whole, you know, if you look at the demographics of Israel, anyone who's really under the age of 30 is not going to have any recollection of any of this, and maybe even 34, 35 is going to have no recollection of that. And your most demographic situations, that's usually 60, 70 percent of your population. Well, so, you, you know what I quoted, and apparently it, it's not true. The younger generation is not buying into it. Um, they're not buying the guff. Well, and that's the double-edged sword of the Internet, because there's enough, even though they don't necessarily know what's good information and what's bad information, that's the downside of, of this, you know, this technological invention, you know, from, from the, the NSA, right, um, from the National Security Agency, to create this double-edged sword, right? The information's out there, right? I mean, all the, the protocols that you had published all the court documents, including the fact that Yigal Amir didn't confess in, in writing until 31 days after he was arrested, when supposedly he confessed that very night to all the investigators, and then the next day walked into the courtroom saying that if he said what he knew, the whole government would come down. So <clears throat> He gave the uh, Oswald version of I'm a patsy. Exactly, exactly. And, of course, we'll probably never know the truth what happens, but the point I'm oh, trying yes, to make is will. that... Oh, yes, we will. Well, I'm well, determined. People like you, okay, good, good. Well, I hope you make it happen. So, well, my, I guess the my fact greater of the point, matter is I already made it happen. I'd like to know how did you, how did you publicize it? This became the first item on, the, on Israeli news for 10 days, let's well, say. Well, what did you it, do to get it out there? Um, ironically, I'll be, I'll be completely honest with you. This is the Israeli government screwing it up. They, pub they publicized this. Because really? 
what happened is I was looking for another debate partner to, to present the other side to you. And so I started looking in the phone book, and I went to, I looked up uh, Justice Mayor Shumgar, and he was right there in the Jerusalem phone book. I called his house, spoke to his wife for a couple minutes in Hebrew, and asked if I could speak with him in English. She said, sure. Um, I, you know, Mayor Shumgar told me straight up that he couldn't help. He was really nice. Uh, he couldn't present the other side because there were, you know, secret, uh, secret, I guess, sessions that he had presided over and that he couldn't tell the full truth, yada, yada, yada. So he told you that? That's what he told me. Again, oh, real nice. I, I had no, you know, again, I was young and naive. I didn't really have any reason to doubt him at that point. But it's interesting, within 24 to 36 hours after that conversation, all the posters that we had made uh, and put around the campus got ripped down. And the student, uh, the student um, uh, organizations on campus from OFEC or from the Merits and the, and the labor as well as the Likud groups on campus, they all started getting very active and very vocal about the fact that we are bringing um, a conspiracy theorist, quote unquote, to and, and that we we would be legitimizing a conspiracy theorist and bringing them to an academic institution. And that was I'm going to tell you a story. I, I'm going to interrupt for a second. Before I met you for the lecture, Channel One, uh, folks, that's the government channel, the big deal back then, had. Uh, where was this? I think the Marriott. They're interviewing me just before the lecture, and I blew it. I gave a terrible interview. But then their camera screwed up, and I got a second chance. And I said, folks, maximum, I'm wrong. Minimum, I'm right. If you don't let me talk, you'll never find out. It, that's what got through. It gave me so much credibility. Look, yeah, and I it's, again, I think you... this interview, I would have been set up for, for uh, legi well, violence, legitimate or not. It would have been horrible if I was bad. And let's be clear, you were, you were, you were really good. But at the same time, the Israeli government, uh, they wanted you to be heard, obviously, in the way that they wanted to frame it. Because, you know, the events, and we've, we've doc you and I have documented the events in total and, and how it went down and how the Israeli government basically sabotaged it through their through using the, their agents provocateur in the, in the political groups on campus. We've documented that in the past on the show, and we'll go into that now, but in short, they made sure that not a single student went in there to hear you. Oh, they, they sure, sure did. I walked through a fake riot. It looked like right. there was a riot, but there wasn't right. a riot. <laughs> But they couldn't. But they wouldn't let any of those students in, nope. and that was, and that was pre-planned. But what yep. they did, because they had they had arranged that specific venue so they could lock it all off. But, but I got savvy in the middle of this, realizing that journalists were being let in through the back side door. Yes. Or whatever. Oh, and I went outside. Oh, you're taking my notes right out of my hands. But they let the media in. What are they nuts? Well, Look. well, I don't think they're nuts at all. I think they wanted to make you. I think they wanted to bait you and try to make you look like uh, a nutcase. And so they sent everybody in. Well, I sent my students around the same way around the side, and they denied all my students from coming in. Uh, so they denied any students from coming into the front or the back, but they ensured that every journalist got access in there. And as you know, I think I've told you my story in the past, but there was a, a gentleman from Galei Tzahal named uh, Ilan Yonas, and that's the, for, for the people that don't know, that's the military radio station and, uh, in Israel, and it was the dominant form of news, even over TV back in the day. I don't know if that's still the case it today. It plays the best rock and roll. So 20 years ago, though, it was where people got their news from. Their, their dominant right. form of news was, was you know, the military radio station. So he came and interviewed me the night before, and basically, you know, when we sat down, he's like, hey, how you doing? You know, how's your time in Israel? You know, why'd you come? You know, are you having fun? And then he said, why are you doing this? And he said, okay, great, great interview. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I thought we were going to have, like, a real interview about this. You know, and then he chopped me up on, the, on the, the radio the next day. And the same guy came up to me while you were speaking. And he said, hey, Brian, how many of your students I wasn't here speaking. I went journalist to journalist one by one. I never gave okay. a speech. 
Interesting. Okay. And unfortunately, I was, as you know, I was scrambling trying to get them to open it up so that we could have this debate for real. And oh, had, Brian, I've I got to remind you, back then, of the few documents I had, I got many more documents afterwards, but I had the medical documents from Ikala, from the hospital, showing Rabin was shot three times, not twice like the government said, and the the final shot was from the front, and Amir never, ever shot from the front. We have the tape. I showed them this, and come the weekend, favorable press. I mean, really good press. In Yerushalayim, they gave me a great article. What happened is it backfired on them. Some I journalists I understood I wasn't a nut, and they gave me good press. I remember Ellie Wogelertner from the uh, Jerusalem Post gave a, a really balanced article as well at the time. I remember the doing whole an interview thing with him on backfired. That. I was supposed to look like a nutcase, and lo and behold, I had genuine evidence. Well, Barry, let me, let me take that a step further to show you what their agenda was in making you look like a nut. First of all, they tried to sell it with me, and it didn't work. They, they used that to try to get me to cancel my event so many times it wasn't funny. But as you know, I was going to, I was going to the United States that night to, to go to D Washington, D.C. for the APAC National Policy Conference. Um, and the same Elon Jonas came up to me and said, hey, Brian, how many of your students are in here? And I lied. I, I kind of stretched the truth a little bit. I think there was, like, maybe me and two others before, you know, they had their little sabotaged events with their agents provocateur. And I said, oh, five. I probably got, well, actually, before I answered, I said, well, why would you ask me such a question? I said, there's been a security pretext outside that's, that security has used to preclude anybody from coming in the building. I said, so why would you even ask me that question? It's not even relevant. And he said, well, I just want to know how many of your students, are, you know, came. And I said, well, I've got about two to 300 students outside right now. Uh, and then another couple hundred who are not my students who want to protest. And he said, no, 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 I'm not talking about outside. I'm talking about the people inside, you know. How many students are actually in this forum right now, in this, you know, auditorium? And I, this is where None. I said the truth. None. None. There was four, no like, one. There was five. There were five. There were, uh, let's there say were there were five. three and five. Okay. okay. There was almost nobody because they weren't allowed in. So I get on the plane that night, and you drove me to the airport that night after all this, um, when you, Joel, and David Perkins and I were hanging out at the Hyatt afterwards. But you drove me to the airport that night because um, they, had, I think they changed the date of this thing and then changed the venue and all that other stuff. So because they really tried to sabotage this. So when I'm no on the joking. airplane, I sit next. I sit next to this beautiful woman, and she was probably an Intel asset. Uh, she was going to China on business, and we're flying through Amsterdam. And I asked her, uh, you know, oh, my gosh, I heard all these amazing stories on the, on the radio about riots in Jerusalem and Hebrew you, and I'm a student there, and, you know, what happened? You know, just trying to play kind of dumb. And she goes, oh, it was, it was really nothing. It was some conspiracy guy that they brought some... American students brought some conspiracy guide to the university, and 500 people showed up outside to protest, and only five students came inside to actually listen. That's what they reported on Galei Saha. It was brilliant, oh, gosh. right? These guys it's are worse than brilliant. I thought. Okay. Well, of course, because these guys run states. These guys have run states for far longer than you and I have tried to disrupt them, right? So, or try to oh. make them be honest. But that was what they wanted to do, and you're right. It did backfire. Amazingly you know, there's bad. enough democracy in Israel that if presented fairly and objectively evidence, you do have the occasional journalist who will report accurately, and it got through. You do, you do have that, but I would almost contend, almost to, to, to paraphrase from one of Richard Linklater's films in 1995 called Before Sunrise, that democracy is a new form of fascism. It's just a more subtle and, and convincing form where everything looks like it's free because there's lots of diversity in, of opinion out there. Most of that opinion is, is highly controlled, even in the alternative media, a lot of it is. Uh, one, so, who in the Jerusalem Post wrote that article? I've forgotten that, and I was very grateful. Who was it? Um, I believe his name was Ellie Wolgelertner. 
Oh, yes, Ellie. He, yep. he was very fair. Look, the press was even Stephen about me. For sure. Yeah, he was he was fair and balanced in how he, how he presented it. He didn't he did not present a skewed vantage point, but he was with me when they were telling me that, that they were going to cancel the event and asked for permission to cancel the event. And I said, no, I won't give permission to cancel the event. I said, but I will give permission to postpone the event and we'll do the event at another date when I come back. Because I was going to be gone in the United States for three weeks. And they said, okay, well, we'll give you that permission. Because I refused to cancel the event. Because I knew if I canceled it, they would just say, nope, we're not giving you permission because you canceled the last one. Oh, so you, so you really took a stand. And by the way, remember, I was at the... The, the Hyatt or the Marriott, wherever, doing this TV interview, I wasn't aware of any of this. For sure, yeah. We, we got separated most of the night, except for, I think, about 30 minutes beforehand. And when we walked up there together, the four of us, me, you, Joel Bannerman, and David Perkins. And I'm going to remind you, after the, we're going to take a short break, and I'm going to remind you when, look, I thought there was going to be real, real violence against me. And I believe you. Um, and that's when we were taken for our own protection, they said, to the guardhouse. Yeah, was I that you or was that here. Perkins? I think that was Perkins. I wasn't taken to the guardhouse. All right. But I came, if I came if it wasn't for, for him, I think what was planned for me was really bad. That's what I think. I think Perkins kept me alive. I think all of you guys kept me alive. I think real violence was the the intention um, that the conspirator was legitimately beaten to shreds. Um, yeah, I have to admit, I you know I had to ask myself at the, at the very time of doing this, you know, because I didn't know much about how this stuff worked, but um, it was scary enough to me to ask, to ask myself, hey. You know, could they try to take this guy out? And, you know, could I be in the mix if they try, if, if they do try to do this? Because, as you know, this, this, this event did not happen. This is not a, I mean, this is not a, an event that seemed to have completely hashed out of, you know, out of the Israel, uh, you know, Shabak by itself. They had a lot oh, of help from outside no. sources. But do you remember the moment when, why was I taken to the guardhouse? It's, I, I didn't I fall admit, in fear. They told me it was for my own safety. Yeah, I don't believe... I, I think that was a pretext, honestly. I don't think they were... No gonna kidding. Hurt you. I, I think they were going to scare you. I think they were going to make you an offer that you couldn't refuse and basically scare the bejesus out of you and, and tell you, not that being Jewish you had a lot of bejesus in you, but they were going to try to scare you intensely, intensely, to make sure you shut up and never talk again. And because and Perkins David was and there, and they didn't pull whatever they were planning. They didn't. They didn't do. Yeah. Well, again, like I said, they they took the shot to try to publicize you to an extent, and then and then enough of the the truth got out. But remember this. You know, you mentioned before about having some of those documents come forth that, that talk about the bullet wound through the chest. But remember, it was uh, if Ryan Snay got on TV as well as. Um, I think oh, Snay, you brought up Snay. Now, why? <laughs> Snay said something remarkable. Remind me of it. Well, he said, he said that the night of the assassination, the prime minister has been shot once through the chest, once through the abdomen, and once with a, with a, like a crushing of the spine. Fantastic. So. And that's the health minister, folks. Uh, folks, we're coming back in three minutes. And boy, this is just clicking my memory back into 1997. We're with Brian Bunn. We'll be back in three. And this interview is going great as far as I'm concerned. You brought back memories. Folks, see you in three minutes. ahead of the dominant media, FirstAmendmentRadio.com, and 
FirstAmendmentRadio.net. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased. It has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity. Invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. Folks, this has been quite an interview. Um, look, you get all, you know what? The book you want to get is Who Murdered These Cock Rabin? Black and white or color. It's at www.lulu.com, lulu.com, or write in my name in the search box, Books Chamish, C H A M I S H, and Thank you, David Samarin. I have a website, BarryChamish.com. Uh, and uh, by the way, do you want people to get a hold of you, uh, Brian? Uh, yeah, people are welcome to, to get in touch with me, although I'll be honest, I, I, have to, I don't really do uh, a lot of political stuff anymore. Um, I, doing this for several years afterwards, I realized it was much harder to get people to kind of wake up and make changes in their life. And I started getting involved in more medical and nutrition and public health research uh, let's 15 stick years with, ago. For that side of things, you can write David, but also for the side that he organized. I'm not joking when I say this. A historical event in Israel, and it, it's, well, it's eating away at the, at the morale of the country and that's not a good thing because, frankly, I don't think assassination, blaming it on the religious and blaming it on the right and blaming it on the majority of the population lying through their teeth is a really nice thing to do. There, I said it. How do people get a hold of you? Uh, well, I'm actually starting a nonprofit foundation here uh, pretty soon called the Living, Living Healthy Homes. Um, I've secured the website, but uh, I haven't really uh, secured any email access, but uh, they can look for that 
Um, I, I do a lot of things to try to help people um, from many of the things that are basically challenges and maybe hazards in their life. So on the environmental front in their homes and, and whatnot. So, and, and I'm out in the, the Phoenix area right now. So, um, but yeah, so look for uh, living healthy homes. Uh, dot org uh, to the nonprofit uh, foundation. I would say uh, do that again, but it's a lot slower. Yeah. So living. No, no. Healthy, the address oh, a lot slower. Oh, the, the, yeah, the address is livinghealthyhomes.org. dot org. All right, folks. We are um, archived for a week. If you didn't catch that, we're at libertyarchives dot com. All right, Dave, let's go back to this this night. Now, I have my motivations. I saw a lie. It broke my heart that this was my country. And I thought, you make things better by writing and researching and telling the truth. It didn't exactly work out that way. No, no. And honestly, I, I did this for the same love. I was, you know, I was... Uh, programmed for for good or for bad, uh, you know, with with all kinds of Zionist stories and my Jewish education growing up, and you know, my, I was a Judaic studies uh, academic um, student, and I did Judaic studies and history with minors at the time in philosophy, psychology, and Hebrew. So uh, I'm found myself in this middle of this historical event, and as a historian, I wanted the historical record to be correct. And I thought, you know, maybe maybe there was a simple explanation, and maybe there was something more. And obviously, as you and I began to found out, find out over and over again, there was much, much more. Well, I so want you to know <laughs> that because the media came into this lecture, and I met a few in person, and a few liked me, I got invited to do TV. I did major primetime TV sh- Lot, well, four of them, let's say. But the point is, they tried to make me look foolish and radical, but I was rational, and it, it backfired. I wasn't bad on TV. I looked good. I explained well. That was from this lecture. Yeah, again, first of all, the facts were, were there. You know, it's not like there were nine million holes in it, and you, had, you know, where you've got like a thousand piece puzzle, and you've only got 42 of the pieces, and you're trying to extrapolate. We had a good, and you, I would say especially, you know, had a good six, seven hundred of those pieces. So filling in the details wasn't that difficult. Um, that makes it a lot easier, and of course, being articulate always helps. For sure. You know, the mythology, this is where the problem really lies. The Jews can look. It's not that Israel is a lying, murderous place, but there is a segment of its ideology that's dreadful. It's ruining the country, and it's got to be fixed up. There, my well, opinion. Yeah, you say that though, Barry. And let me be critical of that to an extent too, because you know a lot of this ideology was created by by big powers. Uh, they were European powers who definitely had their say, and, and the, the transformation happened even before World War I, but it definitely kernelized after World War I when the British put both, you know, Hajimin al-Husseini in power for the Palestinians or for the, you know, the Arabs at the time, and they put in uh, Herbert Samuel at the time, and then they... They did the same thing they did in Nigeria, in Bangladesh, in India, Pakistan, in Zimbabwe, in you Indonesia, get in worse. South Africa. You want to get serious, you start doing the transfer agreement and the horrible, horrible finaglings of the labor Zionists during the 30s that led directly to approving Oh, come on. Uh, uh, Kastner was in Hungary while Eichmann was sending 450,000 Jews to Auschwitz dressed as in, in his SS uniform. Okay, I'm getting emotional. I shouldn't do this. All right. Yeah, again, uh, you know, and, and we, know the, you know, we know the roots of the Catholic Church and a lot of that. We know the, 
the roots of the English and a lot of that, as well as the Germans, and the, the royal connections between a lot of them. And, uh, and we know about the, you know, the, the Catholic Church and its behavior afterwards by, by starting to smuggle a lot of these mouthy operatives out. But I would worry is, is about that Jews could... getting rid of political revi- uh, rivals, uh, especially the religious, but all just by having the Nazis wipe them out to the last man. Well, just like Kissinger today considers the elderly useless eaters, um, the labor Zionists at the time obviously considered, uh, you know, those backwards religious Jews, quote unquote, right? From their perspective, right? They were just tied up with the same eugenicists. They considered them useless eaters, and they didn't want the undesirables to, to procreate. And you know, the Catholic Church was happy to keep the Jewish number present but small, because the the Jewish the, the Jewish presence is always key to the story of Christianity. And so the Catholic Church has always wanted to keep it around, but keep it controlled and keep it small. So well, I know what you're saying, and without diving into the worst of it, the business with Kastner and Eichmann, Eichmann was the only Nazi ever convicted in Israel. He was shut up in a soundproof... Okay, uh, it's not for me to go into it. You know what this lecture of yours led to? Um, a lot of a real things, good you... thing. Oh, a going? phone call and a visit from Elan Greenfeld of Geffen Books that led to my Hebrew book contract. It led to the book being translated and successfully to the top of the bestseller list. Without the lecture that you organized, I wouldn't have had the book. That's all. Well, again... Yeah, I'm just glad that, I mean, it, it wasn't just me, it was it was a whole host of people. I mean, again, if I didn't have a student government that unanimously uh, supported this event, if I didn't have, uh, you know, the professor at Hebrew University, the history professor, to to really bounce things off of, and even though he didn't couldn't provide official support for it, you know, he was the sounding board for me and how I, how I get this done. And, of course, if I didn't have the chutzpah to try to take this on, you know, being young and naive and not being scared of, of big governments. Um, yeah, there's a whole lot of, you know, and again, David Perkins educating me and Joel Bannerman and you guys. Uh, How did Perkins educate me. Now, look, I knew David and I do know David. Um, we planned something uh, when Oslo was signed and it, the PLO were coming back to Israel and, and Black Days were coming. He... Um, uh, printed out, not printed, made out of cloth, black Israeli flags um, to protest um, the black days that were coming. That's how I knew Perkins. Uh, How did you know him? Well, I met him at your event. He had a table full of literature of all kinds of stuff, and he was kind enough to give it to me to consider when I said, hey, I made, you know, ask him to come, I may ask Barry to come to my university and, and speak there possibly, since I'm the president of student government, so I think he saw an opportunity hey, I'm going to give all this material to this Brian guy, and, and and he had all kinds of stuff and I'm sure some of it some of it wasn't true at all, some of it was, you know, big New World Order you know, conspiracy stuff and uh, not that there's not a lot of truth in a lot of that stuff, it's just I think too much of it's co-opted um, you know, when you go to Google that, it's going to take you right to them um, so I'm not a big fan of, of using Google to go no, David, find these, these big David terms. was very exuberant, um, but he knew truth. You, you had to narrow him down. He knew the Rabin truth. Um, that's all I'm going to say. He did have a side to him that was, you know, outgoing. Well, so it helped me. I mean, I, I was, again, I was on the leadership track becoming a politician in, in D.C., uh, or at least working for politicians. Um, I had some good connections to some Jewish bankers back in the U.S., and I wanted to go to law school and, and you know, start a political career to, you know, quote-unquote, make a difference. And how did that work what, out? Uh, well, after this event, I decided I wanted nothing to do with it. I wanted nothing to do with power, because the thing is, is that I knew from inside, when I was with APAC, right, I knew that these Republican Democrats, these, these, you know, these differences that they have on TV... A lot of times they're manufactured. This is a lot of yep. theater. 
And yeah, most people our don't previous know guest said the same thing, by the way. Yeah, it's, Joel it's, said it's the same scripted thing. theater. Everybody has their roles to play, and everybody has their scripts. And there's going to be 30 topics that they'll talk about, and no two will have any more than like 24 things in common, so that nobody can get to the truth. Everybody stays confused because everybody contradicts each other. And then those become talking points that everybody else goes and, and talks about. And this happens in the alternative media as well as the mainstream. But we knew that there was a lot of BS out there. And we knew that we should stay away from that and don't get caught up in, in fact, that was one of the first things that we were taught. Don't pay attention to politics. Don't pay attention to all the bickering on TV or anything like that. That storyline is, is not for us. Pay attention to policy, because if you understand the policy, you'll understand who made it, why they made it, and why they intentionally made that. You guys said in the last segment, by the way, with uh, uh, Mr. Skousen, I, I believe, Barry, you said the system isn't working. And I thoroughly disagree, right, because the system is working beautifully. For, well, for is, those, uh, you know, if you want to play by the rules, it's working great. If you happen to be inside, not so good if you're not. Point. But just as always, the system was created by those inside for those inside. Plain and simple. It's never been anything else, and it probably will never be anything else. That's one thing I think... Oh, really I'd safe. like to believe that at least... All right. What I believe doesn't well, matter. Again, I'm Let's not, talk... I'm not saying, and I'm not saying you're wrong. I hope you're right. I really hope you're right. But I, I tell you, I don't believe it. And that's why I've shifted my focus away, even though I still write scientific papers on policy... I don't think policy is the best way to make change anymore. I think people need to make their change and need to stop giving their energy, their time, their money, their attention, their fear, whatever, to things that don't benefit them. And I, I'd I like to add, I'm talking about one movement in Israel that unfortunately founded the state, but the right wing, the Chayrut, the Irgun, the religious I think they were guiltless. I never found major, major crimes. I found them to be major, major victims. Um, you know, that may, be, that may be the case, but unfortunately, we don't know enough about the real roots of those movements and who financed them, because we all know what the Hegelian dialectic is. And, and just for your listeners that don't know, it's the, the process by which um, a solution is determined at the beginning, and then they manufacture a crisis, and they agitate on both sides, and then magically come up with the, the very solution that was their goal in the first place. You know, so Rabin that, tried to shoot Bacon out of the water. He came very, very close. Um, the, that uh, ship called the Altalena was filled with arms. But more to the point, I disagree with you. Um, I, I think... Um, the right were trying to preserve uh, some Jewish honesty and create a, a Jewish state based on honesty. That's what I think. That's what I hope, anyways. Let me. Let, so, yeah, again, understand, I hope you're right, but I've seen too much in history that shows me that, again, just like Lenin said, and this is Vladimir Ilyich, you know, not uh, John. Not John, uh, okay, I got it. A hundred years ago, right? The best way to, to control the opposition is to be the opposition, or is to lead it ourselves, as he said, is the exact quote. But the point is, is that most opposition is controlled, and it's controlled through innuendo, it's controlled through subtlety, it's controlled through finance, it's controlled through so many different techniques. So... I, I just don't presuppose that that's magically... Uh, uh, Brian, you know, i got to tell you, I have to tell you, and this is from experience. I gave my lecture in Israel, in Hebrew, I guess, 300 times. Now, most were religious crowds, but I faced the left. And inevitably, a riot for the first 20 minutes... Then they started listening. Then they started respecting. And at the end, my co-Jews, I don't know if they were my advocates, but they finally respected the research I did. The right Very. never had that problem. The religious rarely had that problem. 
Just to let you know. Though, I think, I, I think you're, you're touching on a very important point, uh, and that very important point is that those people had access to you for 90 minutes straight. Most people every single day make all their decisions based on 30 seconds of this, 15 seconds of that, you know, eight second sound bites, et cetera, et cetera. And that's a very different world of trying to figure out how to, how to make the termination. So yeah, you're right. You can absolutely make change that way. If you can directly reach those people, I'm sure you have completely changed their lives. I stood up to them. Reached. I was not a coward. Um, I, there were some mighty hairy moments, and I stood up to it. And they saw that as well, I think. Well, Barry, at the, at the same time, though, I mean, I was involved in this historical event just as you were, right? And a lot sure. of my friends who were friends with me at the time and who were roommates of mine at the time and friends of mine and, and political you know, allies of mine at the time, these people post on the Rabina assassination on their Facebook page like what we did never even happened. And so there's a reality of the fact that once you step away from that, you, like Barry Hamish as a, as a center of influence, and then you go back to your mainstream narrative, right? The psychic driving is always going to win until you turn that stuff off. And that's why I said I don't believe in the, the system anymore as a, as a real means of political change. I'm going to add, have- I'm, I'm going to add the final of our quadrangle. I assume I was in one of the corners of the quadrangle, but so was my partner in Inside Israel, my editor, Joel Bainerman. Now, whatever happened to me, and life didn't go perfect, but he made the mistake of investigating Pollard, and that led him to someone named Victor Marchetti, and then Iran-Contra, and then Perez. He had cancer in Washington after Marchetti gave him a tie to put on, you'll look better with the tie. His neck blew up. He had cancer within three months. He died at 53. Um, I possibly got off lucky. Possibly. And, and, and I'll be honest with you, it's, it's that kind of stuff and the attempts that were on your life, Barry, that 15 years ago made me take a whole different direction of where my life was going to go. Um, because by and large, unless the system backs you, and they want to use you for agitation, you don't do well. You don't do well in this, and it's very hard, and, and I'm sure, and I know you've lived a hard life, um, probably much more than your listeners know. Um, oh, you've my sacrificed Lord, a lot. I'm not going to fetch, but... <laughs> um, no, but you uh, sacrificed a lot for, for the Jewish people, for Israel, and for truth. And The problem um, is the Jews think that anything truthful is an attack on Israel. They, they, they reinvent the rules. And so suddenly, I am anti-Semitic. I mean, it's, it's, it's so wrong and, and so wacky. But they use Barry, this. you're also a Holocaust denier. Remember, you were a Holocaust denier, too. <laughs> did I get that? Yeah. It would that's shock how they me, tried to, that's did how I they get tried that? To convince me. They tried to convince me not to bring you to the campus because you were a Holocaust denier. I deny the Holocaust. That's a new one. Yeah, they said, yeah, they would twist your words around. This is what they do. They're brilliant at it. They're brilliant at it. And again, they have louder voices. They have more money. And, you know, they're able to do what they need to do. So that's how it works. And we need to be savvy to that and understand that most of these people are going to go tune into their nightly news or their favorite alternative news people who are really, really big. And they're going to be deceived, either because of misinformation or because of disinformation. And it's really hard to try to figure that out. In fact, um, kind of an offshoot of that, I wanted to bring some clarification to something that you and Skousen were talking about during the first hour. Okay, I'll read it, folks. He typed this. Ask me quickly about Kissinger and Putin at the beginning of the next segment. All right, go ahead. So here's the the quick take on that. As I was watching C-SPAN about, I don't know, nine to ten months ago, something like that. They had a couple authors who had written this about big biography on Putin. And they had mentioned that Putin didn't speak German very well, yada, yada, yada. But they did mention that Putin has met with Kissinger almost 20 times over the, over the years that he's been in power. So, and now you've talked in the last hour about Putin and the Netanyahu meeting. 
Well, I don't remember if it was from you directly, but I believe it was through your Inside Israel 20 years ago. But you mentioned the fact that every time Netanyahu came to, and, and Rabin even for that matter, came to the United States, they met with who else? Yeah. That's Henry not Kissinger. just me. That's Joel, and I saw the pattern. Uh, without so, Joel, you know, I'm very lucky in my life. I had a Joel who directed me. Um, I was scattered. Uh, he pinpointed me. Yep. That's CFR, like a that's focus, Kissinger, but, that's the worst. But, but here's what I want to take from that. It's that Putin is taking his orders from the same people that Israel is, from the same people that run the United States. These nation states failed to be the dominant form of power back in the 50s and 60s. In fact, even in the early, the late 90s and early 2000s, of the top 100 uh, economies in the world, more than half of them were corporations. The nation states really have failed to be the dominant force uh, of power in the world, even though they're still used for administrative purposes and for military purposes and, and you know, All trade right. purposes. I'm going to say this because we're running out of time. I say to people who talk about this Putin meeting uh, with Netanyahu a month ago, I say, you, can you really trust a guy whose anagram is input? My question is, can you trust anybody who's groomed by the same politicians, the same, you know, the same... I like group, my input joke positive. better than... I, I think of that's a, a much better view on life. <laughs> I, and I'm being serious, though. But again, so I'm being you serious, too. So you think there's a way out of this... Netanyahu met with Putin, and Putin bombed Syria the next day. You, you think right. I didn't derive a conclusion or two from that? No, I think, I think you're savvy enough to do that. I'm just saying, who are they taking their orders from? Who's really controlling the narrative, the situation, the, you know, the situation on the ground? That's what's, that's what's going on. You're right. It was a good observation. I think Joel will listen. I'm going to direct you both to libertyarchives.com. You get to hear this for a week. Look, what you mentioned is a good observation, but the important thing is you kicked my memory back to that night. What was the date of the lecture? April 2nd, 1997. It, it was an April 2nd joke. <laughs> All right. Yeah, you're your book, Folks, your book I have yeah, gotten book. so much of this. Um, and, uh, Brian, thank you for making me remember. Uh, I think right. I blocked out a chunk of it, too. It's my honor, because this is, this is the, t the week of the 20th anniversary of uh, the Rubina assassination, and, of course, they're still up to their antics. They've got Haggai Amir, who just got out of jail the last couple yeah, of years. Yeah, you saw that. You saw they're that. They're putting him in the news. It was yeah. preordained. <laughs> Oh, okay. I was going to mention that with Joel, that they brought him out uh, to uh, that's a file. denounce that's a, that's the a, conspiracy that's a theorists. File. They brought out the old tricks, but we're running out of uh, time. Thank you, Brian Bunn. Folks, this has been Barry Chamish. We'll Thank see you, you next Barry. Tuesday. Our guest, last name only for now, Cook. Um, I won't say anything more. And thank you, everyone. See you next week. Thank you.